Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Representative Phillips, for graciously accepting our invitation to come to campus and sharing your perspective with students and the Upper Valley community. My name is Grace Wilkins, and I am the PR director of the Dartmouth Political Union, the preeminent nonpartisan, student-led or political organization here on campus. The DPU has joined with the Rockefeller Center to co-sponsor this event series, The Path to the Presidency. For today's program, we have asked Representative Phillips to make opening remarks and then hold some moderated discussion, followed by questions from the audience. Vice President Emma Wolf will be moderating our discussion today. Vice President Wolf is the inaugural Vice President of, the government, of government and Community Relations at Dartmouth College, previously serving as the Senior Advisor to the President for External Relations and Leadership Development at Barnard. From 2018 to 2022, she served as Deputy Mayor and Chief of Staff to the Mayor of New York City. Previously, Ms. Wolf served as the Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for the City of New York, overseeing offices at federal, state, and local levels to achieve policy, legislative, and budgetary outcomes. When we get to the Q&A portion of our program, we will have a microphone available for our in-person audience questions. However, if you are joining us remotely, please submit your questions during the first 20 minutes of our program by emailing rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. Please keep these audience questions brief so we allow time for as many questions as possible. We also would like to emphasize the importance of maintaining a respectful dialogue throughout this event. Representative Dean Phillips describes himself as a father, businessman, civic leader, eternal optimist, and representative from Minnesota's third congressional district in Congress. A gold star son who lost his birth father in the Vietnam War Dean was adopted into the Phillips family when his mother, Dee Dee, married Eddie Phillips, who raised Dean to work hard and always share success. Dean was raised in Edina, attended, Adina, attended Brown University, <laughs> and returned to Minnesota to earn his MBA from the University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Business. After working at a variety of small startups, he worked his way up and eventually led his family's business, Phillips Distilling. He later let, went on to help build Talenti Gelato into one of the top selling ice cream brands in the country and open Penny's Coffee, a small business in the Twin Cities. In Congress, Dean is focusing on restoring Americans' faith in our government. He's on a mission to inspire a new era of collaboration in Washington, pursue common ground for the common good, and end the corrupting influence of special interest money in our politics. Dean is vice ranking member of the House Small Business Committee and ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs, Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia Subcommittee. The nonpartisan Luger Center ranks Representative Phillips as the 13th most bipartisan out of the 435 members of Congress. He has been named a fiscal hero by the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget and was recognized by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce with the Jefferson Hamilton Award for Bipartisanship in the 116th and 117th Congress. Dean has two adult daughters, Daniela and Pia, and he lives in Wayzata, Minnesota with his wife, Annalise, and Henry the Norwich uh, Terrier. <laughs> On October 27th, Representative Phillips declared his candidacy for the Democratic nomination for president. Please welcome me, please help me in welcoming Dartmouth uh, with Representative Dean Phillips. Thank you and welcome. Nice job, hey, nice job. Hey everybody, I have to give you a lot of credit there. Uh, Edina, you were very close. Wyzetta is probably the, so in Minnesota if you run for office and you really wanna like embarrass a candidate who may not be prepared, you ask them to pronounce Wyzetta and you did a really good job. So, hey everybody, I'm so grateful to all of you for taking some time with me. And I have to tell you, this is kind of fun to be back here. My first and only previous visit to Hanover and to Dartmouth was in the spring of 1987, when I was a senior in high school. And my father took me on my very first college trip, came here, and I applied, and I was denied entrance. So I had to go to Brown. <laughs> Through, a, through, a, through Connecticut College, but that's a whole different story. And, um, but to be in front of you is very humbling and exciting. Uh, and I also want to let you know that I've probably had one of the most profound hours that I've had in the last five years as a member of Congress uh, with the DPU. We sat around a table, uh, had a great conversation. I had no idea about the political perspectives of those with whom I was meeting. 
And I was struck by this conversation we had, the engagement of the students with whom I was speaking, but also this extraordinary bridge and common ground that I discovered through a very strange moment that I will never forget. So I wanna thank you for giving me the gift of inviting you to Dartmouth today and affording me that very moment because as I will tell you and wrap this up at the end of the um, town hall, that moment embodies exactly what our country needs, exactly what I intend to do, uh, and exactly what I would ask and encourage and promote amongst all of you uh, to consider, which is to give space and place, create space and place for people of different backgrounds, races, religions, politics, and geographies to sit down and find some commonality. And that's how we're gonna solve all the problems facing this country, facing the world, and that's how, why you are so integral uh, to building the very future that I'm afraid and disappointed by the fact that past generations um, did not do so well. And that's why I'm in front of you today. I'm, I'll make my comments brief because I want to get to all of you. Uh, you heard a little about my bio, which indeed starts by losing my father in Vietnam. Uh, I was six months old. He earned an ROTC scholarship, some of you in this room maybe as well, because he could not afford college. And thankfully, the United States government afforded him the chance to secure an education. And he was sent to Vietnam months before I was born, uh, got to see the United States land on the moon. And I think that's a remarkable truth because two days later he was killed in a helicopter crash in Pleiku, Vietnam. And here he is watching up above the United States of America achieve perhaps the most extraordinary human mission in world history the most extraordinary blessing, the most extraordinary um, uh, mission ever, and yet is sitting halfway around the world from home in one of the most biggest, in one of the biggest debacles in American history, and that was the Vietnam War. Uh, and I share that with you because therein lies the American truth. When we're at our best, we are extraordinary. And when we're not, we can be very dangerous, both to our own countrymen and women and also to the world. And when I lost my father, I was six months old. We moved in with my great grandparents because my mom was 24 and widowed and had nobody. And that's how my life began. And when I was adopted into a great family, when I was about three and a half, uh, my life changed, not because of something I did, but because I got lucky. Uh, and that good fortune for all of those in, your, in this room uh, who have been beneficiaries of good fortune, whether it be through your own work or your parents or guardians or even the support of others, I think this is a time in our history where we have to really recognize uh, how grateful we should be and convert those great blessings of good fortune uh, into something better. Uh, and that's why I'm doing this. I had a wonderful life. I was in the spirits business and the ice cream business and the coffee business. I do know something about what Americans want. <laughs> and, and I was watching, and I'll tell you, I grew up in this business where my family was really intentional about educating me about the meaning of business. And they said to me, my great grandfather in particular, that business is a means to an end. And the end is not to accrue as much wealth as humanly possible. The mission in the purpose is to share as much as humanly possible with the very people uh, who create it and the communities that make it possible as well. And then he also used to say that money is like manure. If you stack it up, it really stinks. If you spread it out, it fertilizes. And if there was a lens through which I wish the United States Congress would view some of our greatest economic challenges, it's actually through that very lens. We are blessed with extraordinary wealth, something our founders never could have envisioned in a million years. The wealthiest, most successful, longest lasting democracy that exists, almost 250 years. We have enough, it's just how we choose to allocate it. And I wanna get to that a little bit later. Uh, but in 2016, my life is pretty good in Minnesota. I'm the father of two daughters, 16 and 18. One in college, just voted for the first time for Hillary Clinton. Uh, my youngest in my home. Of course, I watched that election like many of you and was astounded that the United States of America had chosen someone like Donald Trump to represent it. And it was a profound and indelible moment for me and I'm sure with some of you. But I went to sleep, I told my family before going to bed, because I'm an optimist, you heard that in my bio, I told my family, like, give the guy a chance. You know, he's not going to be this nuts, this unhinged, this dangerous, when he sits in that Oval Office in the most powerful seat in the entire world. It has to change you immediately and bring you a little bit of humility and empathy. Little did I know, having sat in 
the White House Situation Room, across the table from him. I had never seen somebody who lacked empathy in the way that he did. But I woke up the next morning to the sound of my 16-year-old daughter, Pia, crying in her bedroom. And I did not know at that time, she's a gay woman now, I did not know then, and I suspect that that may have been part of why she was so fearful about what was transition, you know, the transition happening in our country. And we sat down at breakfast, we FaceTimed my daughter, Daniela, in college, and she too was in tears. And it struck me really hard, uh, recognizing first and foremost that a lot of parents wake up to their kids in tears for different reasons, but for me, uh, it was a really astounding moment, bless you. And I sat at that table and I promised them that I would do something. And at that very moment, I did not know what I would do, but I was not going to just sit still, having raised daughters to be participants, not observers. And the next day, I started looking around at what I could do to resist. And I looked at my district in Minnesota. We had not elected a Democrat since 1958. Now, mind you, this is 2016. We had not elected a Democrat since 1958. That was not a, that didn't bode well. And then I looked at the current member of Congress, Eric Paulson, who was kind of a milk toast, um, moderate Republican. He had served four terms. Uh, he had won that night in 2016 by 14 points. And, you know, I do believe in using numbers and data to make decisions. And everybody I spoke to said I was out of my mind if I intended to try to win that election, that I would embarrass myself, that it would be a, a fool's errand. And that's exactly what inspired me to do it. And we did it. And we had fun and we brought joy, we brought optimism. We did it under the ethos and slogan of everyone's invited because that's why I'm in front of you. I don't care about your politics, I care about your principles. I love the notion of a team of rivals, united not by how they see things, but united by a principle that is integral to the future of their community and their country. And we won, we won by 12 points. And the last, last election, my third, we won by almost 20. And it just goes to show, if you listen to Americans and you meet them where they are and you drive a 1960 International Harvester Metro van that I do and open the service window and serve coffee and lemonade and put out chairs and say, come say hello, that anything is possible. And I'll wrap my whole uh, town hall up with you later tonight by telling you a story about this, but that's how I do it. That's how I intend to do it. That's how we will win the presidency. And I just wanna end with this. When I got to Congress in 2019, I was sure that Nancy Pelosi and Kevin McCarthy would do what you do when you are two of the most powerful people in America, push us together. I thought we'd sit at a table and break bread, get to know each other, tell our life stories, do a ropes course and build a little bit of trust. And lo and behold, systemic segregation in the US Congress, your Congress, started on day one. They literally put us on different buses going to different events. They did not want us to get to know each other. They did not want to share information with us, and they wanted to keep us as busy as humanly possible so that we would not challenge this centralized power structure on both the right and left. So I resolved in that first week in Congress that I would endeavor to do this differently, that I would have friends on both sides of the aisle over for dinner, which I do, that I would join the Problem Solvers Caucus, which I did and became the vice chair. We're 32 Democrats, 32 Republicans that actually work together. You would never know it, because we have an angertainment industry that would have us believe we are so much more divided than we really are. I love my brothers and sisters on both sides of the aisle because we are committed to doing what is not popular, that generates very little political reward, but also is what the country desperately needs. And I endeavored to work with people who might surprise you. The first bill I, well, the first bill I really got passed was the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act. Um, the Common Ground Committee now has me ranked the number two most bipartisan member of Congress. I had to work with Chip Roy. Anybody know who Chip Roy is? Mm -hmm. Now, I hear, the, I hear the groans. Chip and I are friends. We see very little the same way. But we made a point to get to know each other. Chip actually sent me a note of, of, of gratitude that I stepped up at a time where he thinks the country needs more options too. This is just a couple weeks ago. And we worked together on a bill that we knew would help hundreds of thousands of employees and small businesses make it through COVID. And Donald Trump signed our bill into law. Now, he did not invite me to the signing ceremony, which is what you do as a president, but Chip came to my office the next day and brought me one of the pens uh, that symbolized that good work. The other bill we did was something called DED, Deferred Enforced Departure. I have this wonderful Liberian community in my district in Minnesota, 
uh, they really made me part of their family and I uh, and them part of mine. And during the Trump administration, he wanted to deport this wonderful community because the program that had them here legally had expired. These are people who had been in Minnesota for 25 years, started businesses, had kids, and were horrified by the notion of literally being deported to a country they'd never even spent a day in. And we worked our tail off. I worked with the Liberian community. I worked with some of my, all my Democratic colleagues, a handful of Republicans, uh, some staff in the White House. And we were able to get Donald Trump to sign an extension that saved all their, their businesses, their families, and the risk of being deported. He signed it on a Friday evening, because that's the best time to not get any news coverage. And we got it done. And I'm just saying this because anything is possible when you treat people respectfully. And that's going to be the theme of my remarks tonight. I want to turn it over to you, but I just want to reflect, I want you to reflect tonight on a couple things. What is possible if we end this nonsense? And do you believe that the people that have been creating this nonsense for literally 50 years, I have great respect for President Biden. I believe he was the only man, the only candidate who could have beaten Donald Trump in 2020. I also believe that he is probably the only Democrat who could lose and probably will to Donald Trump in 2024. This is not a campaign of destruction against the president. To the contrary, it is a campaign to prevent the destruction of democracy when Donald Trump beats Joe Biden. And I believe in the United States, we should be a country that promotes competition, that makes access possible for any American that wants to participate, and that also stimulates, encourages, and promotes debate. And I'm afraid right now, my party is actually trying to reduce and stifle and suppress all three. And that's why I'm here. It's gonna to be tough, but it's absolutely possible if all of you vote. And I don't care if you vote for me necessarily, I do care if you vote. And if you do, we can pass the torch to a new generation, which we need here. We can start inspiring that all around the world. The Iranian regime, where you have young Iranians who are disgusted by the people representing them. When you see young Gazans and Palestinians who are disgusted by Hamas. When you see Israelis who are disgusted by their own government right now. Let's inspire them by showing them what's possible in a democracy when the people actually get to make the decision not a bunch of old people sitting in Washington, D.C. And I say that with respect. The choice is yours, and I'm here to answer your questions. I'm Dean Phillips, I'm running for president, because I deeply believe that we can get this done, and we can have some fun, and bring a lot of optimism and hope back to a country that is really in need of it right now. So thanks, everybody. Oh. I think they want you on this side. I'm oh, sure. sorry. Left That's right. my better side. Anyway. <laughs> Perfect. It was important for me as well. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, hi, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, my name is Emma Wolf, Vice President for Community and uh, Government Relations here. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much, Grace and the DPU and Rocky, for putting on this uh, incredible series. Um, and thank you, Congressman. Um, uh, the first question we normally ask, and I'm just going to ask a few, and then we're going to open it sure. up, because the main event, of course, is the audience today. Um, normally, we open this up and we ask what uh, motivates your pursuit of the presidency. I think you answered that quite clearly in your opening remarks. Um, I'd love to hear how your experience has been campaigning in New Hampshire. It's this huh, storied amazing. state, the retail state. Tell us. It has been, I mean, the best word to use is beautiful. I, I wish... All of you could be along for a little part of this journey. Mm -hmm. And um, let me start by going backwards. I spent just about every summer of my adolescence um, at camp in Freiburg, Maine, which is right next to North Conway, New Hampshire. I've climbed, my, climbed Mount Washington, mm -hmm. Franconia Notch. I remember the old man in the mountain, oh. my whoopie pies. Um, <laughs> and I really, when I say this sincerely, I really learned to love my country right here. Mm -hmm. Learned how to canoe and sail and water ski and was in plays and learned how to shoot a gun back when the NRA actually practiced you know, safe firearm usage and taught us how to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my formative experiences were, were done right here. And I start my day every day with phone calls to low dollar donors, small dollar donors. And I do that for a really important reason because my, I can say that Congress people in both the House and Senate are spending 10,000 hours per week mm -hmm. raising money. 10, 000, collectively, 10,000 hours per week raising money. Dialing for dollars, missing votes sometimes, mostly missing committee meetings, missing meetings with constituents because they run across the street to make phone calls, begging for money. 
And it's, this is a simple case I'm going to make. If you're spending that kind of time raising money, what are you not doing? Your job. That's why I have a bill in Congress that would preclude fundraising from 8 in the morning to about 5 at night in, in Washington. But most importantly, you're raising money from people who have it, mm. PACs and lobbyists and wealthy and well-connected Americans, many of whom use that money to remind you of their contributions when they want something. The fact that the United States Congress allows contributions to be made to committee members by institutions and PACs and lobbyists who have business in front of them mm -hmm is the lowest, most grotesque form of legalized corruption I could possibly imagine. And not only do we allow it, it's promoted. I don't take PAC money, I don't take lobbyist money, I don't take member money, I don't give member money, and I don't have a leadership PAC. I'm the only one out of 535 people because it's grotesque. But what really saddens me is when you're spending all those hours raising money from wealthy people, who are you neglecting? The whole country. Literally, 95% of the entire country does not get any outreach from their member of Congress, from their senator, right, from their House member, because they have to spend their time raising it from wealthy people. So what happens? People get angry. They feel unheard. They feel disenfranchised. They feel that when the plant closed in their town and there's no jobs left and there's crummy health care access that costs too much and bankrupts people and kids are going hungry and people sleeping in their streets, life seems chaotic and prices are too high and no one's listening. Does it surprise me that a guy like Donald Trump could make this extraordinary connection to Americans who are angry? Of course not. But that's what's happening. And that's why I'm afraid that when you spend all that time, it's corrupting. So what do I do in the morning, every day here in New Hampshire? I start my day with about 10 phone calls to people who've given five, 10, 20 dollars to my campaign. And they all start the same way. I dial, I say, hello, this is Dean Phillips, candidate for the presidency. And there's always a pause. And then there's more of a pause. And then there's a timid voice usually, male and female, that always says, seriously? <laughs> and I do this because it's the most extraordinary moment you could imagine when someone who never thought that they mattered, never thought that someone cared, never thought someone would ever reach out to them and just say thanks, <coughs> become the most important person in the world to me at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I ask my staff to join me whenever possible because I want them to know that these are the people we're doing this for. We have to do this for. When they give 5 or $10 to this campaign, that's a whole lot more difficult than people who are giving $5,000 at these fancy steakhouses at night. So that's how my day starts. I'm on a mission to meet people where they're at. I, I go to VFWs where it's almost all Republican veterans. And I've had the most glorious times in those rooms with grizzled, old, Trump-loving Republicans. By the end of it, I'm serving drinks. We're doing high fives. <laughs> I'm signing you know, posters for them. We're sharing stories, taking pictures, and finding the very common ground that every one of them, every one of us, and certainly I uh, am craving. And that's what my days are like. They're with you. They're in every town and coffee shop, place I can find people. Uh, and if any of you want to join me on this at some point, come along. Love to have you on the road with me. Hello at Dean24.com. And I mean it. Test us. You want to come along for a day and see what, how we do this, whether it's here or anywhere else in the country? Do it. Because if you do it, you might be inspired to do it yourself, and that's my core mission, is to make sure at some point in your lives that all of you consider serving this great country in some way, shape, or form, because I'm tired of people who do it for their whole careers. I want you to go do extraordinary things first, and then populate our legislatures with people of great life experience. And that's what we need more than ever. We don't have a hardware problem, we have a software problem, and that's the people, mm -hmm. and we can do better. Thank you for that. Um, switching gears a little bit, for uh, you know, and I and I and I know this is always the the less desirous topic um, uh, because we're not going to talk about substance for a second. We're going to talk about campaigning, the the path to get to the presidency. Mm -hmm. Sketch out what you believe your path is. Sure. So the path is a steep slope. I'm not going to kid you. Uh, never in recent modern presidential history has a campaign for the presidency been set up two weeks. Mm -hmm two weeks before filing here in New Hampshire. I'll tell you exactly how, look, I, I, I've been telling the truth. It has gotten me in trouble actually only with a handful of people on MSNBC, Twitter, and Washington. Mm -hmm. It seems to be actually working real well with people who are expecting and are kind of sick that nobody's saying it. Here's how it happened. Uh, a year ago, I was on a radio show and it was asked if the president should run again. And I said, no, I don't think he should. I think he promised to be a transitional president. 
uh, that he had done a great service to the country. I think he had saved it. He the only one that could have won, I think, that year. Uh, but that it was time to pass the torch. And I, Congressman, was yeah. that the first time you had said it? First time. And you, you knew going in what you... So here's how it worked. T July 30th, 2022, I'm on WCCO radio in Minnesota. Chad Hartman, the host, says at the end of the interview, do you think Joe Biden should run again? And I knew my staff would be hmm. going, oh my God, please don't say it, please don't say it. <laughs> and I said, no, he shouldn't. He made an implicit, if not explicit, promise to the country and certainly to Congress that he wouldn't. And I said, look, it's time for, it's time for change. Hmm. He did his job. He made that promise. It's time, though. And then I found it interesting how I got in a little heat. My staff was ugh, so worried. And, but I, what I noticed is when I got back to Washington, all of my colleagues gave me high fives and were like, thank you for finally saying the quiet part out loud. I can't believe he actually might, he's saying he might run again. Mm. And then of course he declared his candidacy, at which point many of us were very surprised. I then started calling for him to pass the torch and if not, at least to encourage candidates whose names you know better than mine to enter the race because that's what you do. Not as third party candidates, mind you, in the Democratic mm -hmm. primary. I literally made calls to some of these candidates, two of whom, Gretchen Whitmer and J.B. Pritzker, literally would not, people who would have taken my call for any other reason on any other yeah, day, right. not only refused my call, they had political operatives take it who asked me not to use their names. I thought, what is going on here? So then I started raising my voice a little bit more and then going on television shows saying, we need alternatives because at the same time, the poll numbers, started going from Joe Biden plus one or two, to even, to minus one or two, to minus three or four, to minus five or six, over the course of all these months. And I'm sure if some of you are paying attention, the most recent polls are the most horrifying. And now he's down almost nine points nationally, five to nine points, he's down in five of six uh, battleground states. Uh, his, his approval numbers are literally at historic lows, other than Jimmy Carter, we all know what happened then in 1980. Uh, and and I thought, oh my goodness, this is really absurd. Because in Washington, within the Beltway, everyone's saying, no, there's no problem, just you know, hopes and prayers and everything's gonna work out just mm -hmm. fine. I'm like, no, it's not gonna work out fine. I know in my district, a purple district, the number of independents and moderate Republicans who voted for President Biden because they recognized we needed to defeat Trump, when they all start telling me there's no way I'm voting for the guy again, it doesn't matter why. I'm a member of House leadership table at this point. I'm trying to market the president's successes, many of which I voted for. Mm -hmm. And I would go back home and people would like laugh at the term Bidenomics, which represents in high inflation and high prices. And I got to a point where I was so upset that I actually left the House leadership table, to which my peers in my caucus had sent me, elected me, because I really found it difficult to continue to sit at a table where everybody knew what the risk was. Everybody knew what needed to be done which meant that the House leadership table and the Senate leadership table should have made an appointment with the White House, sat down with the president, and said, Mr. President, we have affection for you, we respect you, we celebrate you, but you're gonna lose this election and we cannot stand it and we cannot bear it and we have to let you know the truth because you're surrounded by people who are telling you something very different. Not only did that not happen, there was this culture of silence, stay in line, threats, so I resigned and then I was trying to figure out how I could still make a difference. I get a DM from Steve Schmidt on October 11th. Steve Schmidt, formerly John McCain's uh, campaign manager, the same Steve Schmidt who used to be a diehard Republican who was so disgusted by Donald Trump he became an independent and then for three years he's been a Democrat. And the man who many in this country believes almost single-handedly um, made Joe Biden the president by starting the Lincoln Project mm -hmm and helping him achieve those 40,000 votes in just a handful of states that made all the difference, which is why President Biden called Steve Schmidt right after that election to say thank you. Mm -hmm. So I go on Steve's podcast, I get a call from him the next day, and he says, um, I gotta tell you, I shared the podcast with a number of people, and uh, they think, like I do, uh, that you should consider this. He said, I knew that Joe Biden was the only one that could actually defeat Donald Trump in 2020 and you are the only one who can defeat, defeat him in 2024. And I was surprised by that. He said, it was Yom Kippur and I'm Jewish, so we went home. He said, talk to your family this weekend over the holiday and t give me a call on Monday. So I talked to my family, called them on Monday, and I said, look, my family would say sort of okay, <laughs> but I don't have name recognition, I don't have a national team or profile, and I just don't see how we could do this within two weeks. And he said, oh yeah, if you do it, I'm gonna do it and help you get there. Uh, and anything's possible. Hmm. And we did it. We sat at my kitchen table. A handful of people who helped me are in the room right now tonight, one of them right here. 
and we sat at my kitchen table, and in two weeks, we stood up a presidential campaign with a ragtag, wonderful group of people who simply recognize the risk, the consequence, uh, and what's going on. And on the 27th of October, I brought a $1,000 check to the Concord State House, went through this beautiful ritual that you have maintained mm -hmm. for well over a century, and became a candidate for President of the United States, along with 20 other people who are on the Democratic ballot, because this is how it should operate. Mm -hmm. This is how it should work. There should not be a high barrier to entry. It should not cost half a million, a million dollars, four people, legal counsel, to get on the ballot for a campaign in the United States. New Hampshire is special. I wish the rest of the country would recognize how prepared you are, how culturally proficient, mm -hmm. civically engaged you are to challenge us, get to know us, and frankly, help introduce us to the entire country, for better and for worse. And that's how this whole thing has happened. Uh, an extraordinary moment, which life is made up of, and uh, we recognize that we have to do better, and that's how we start this out. Right here, I'll be in South Carolina soon, I'll be in Michigan, I'll be going all across the country, uh, but it all starts here. And this state is amazing, and I wanna thank you for it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna ask just uh, one more question, and then we're gonna open it up because I think we're right around that time. I could say one more thing too. Oh, you please, said the path please, to victory. Please, this is very uh, the, the most please. important part of this is very simple. Uh, there was an unknown Minnesota senator in 1968 by the name of Gene McCarthy, mm. who recognized that President Johnson was terribly unpopular. There was a war that was disgusting him. He recognized that massive numbers of Americans were unheard, and particularly young people. And I think there's an analogy, frankly, to this very moment in this very day. And he entered the primary against a sitting president and was, of course, he went through the same attacks that I am right now. He came this close to beating President Johnson in New Hampshire. And President Johnson left the race because of that. And who entered it? Bobby Kennedy, which meant Gene McCarthy is a footnote in history. Had Bobby Kennedy not been assassinated, I do believe he would have won that election. This country would be in a much different place than it is right now if he had won. Uh, and it's that spirit that that's why New Hampshire matters. We're gonna win New Hampshire as long as all of you get out and spread the word and advocate and be ambassadors and get people to vote. We're gonna win Michigan. We're gonna compete in South Carolina. And if we do, it's game on. And if we don't, and uh, March 6th comes along and uh, we're not competitive, I'll be the first to end the campaign with grace. I'll get behind whomever it is that will ultimately defeat Donald Trump, who's best positioned. I do not think it's gonna be President Biden, but I promise you, Whoever it is, I'll get behind. But I think it's going to be us, and that's all up to you. Thank you. Um, well, we're coming right up on time. You can clap. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. I've heard you speak uh, before. This is my last question. We'll open up. I've heard you speak before about um, our immigration policy mm -hmm. and the crisis at the border. Yeah. Uh, can you just, in a few words, talk about your position on this and your sure. experiences? Let me start by... You know, I would imagine most of us in this room have four mothers or four fathers that came to this country for the same reasons that so many people are crossing the Rio Grande right now. Not everybody in this room, though, I know came that way. Some were brought against their will, and I want to acknowledge that. And we also have a native population that was persecuted, destroyed, and disenfranchised in horrific ways, and that's part of our history, and I want to remind everybody of that. But I want to start with the humanity, which is when America fails to be the welcoming, encouraging, hopeful, compassionate country on which our entire nation was founded, then we fail to be America. And it's as simple as that. So you'll hear me say a lot over this campaign that two things are usually true at once. Rarely does one side get it all right. And this is absolutely the case in immigration law. I've been to the southern border twice because I believe you shouldn't make a darn decision about anything until you see it with your own eyes or until you meet with the person in question. I've been there twice. It is horrifying. It's an embarrassment to the United States. It's the first time in my entire life as an American that I was really appalled by my own nation when I saw human beings kept in cages. When I saw actually the compassion of border patrol agents who were looking after a couple, there was one baby in particular I'll never forget, in a stroller, brought across the border by someone who said he was the father who wasn't, and then abandoned. And this baby, I don't know what happened to this baby, mm. but I think about this little girl all the time because these Border Patrol agents were treating this baby, this infant, with the same love and affection that any mother or father would with their own. And I, I thought to myself, you know, what I'm seeing on you know, MSNBC does not comport with the beauty I was seeing in compassion with many Border Patrol agents. 
many of whom I talked to and said that I want to quit this job because I'm trying my best to, you know, to uphold the law and show compassion, and all I get for it is low pay and misery. Mm. And that struck me. Um, seeing young mothers walking babies across the Rio Grande really struck me. Uh, and then what I realized is our border infrastructure is a complete disaster. Our ports of entry, which are just the, you know, the border the, where the trucks and people come in through the gates and the facilities, are, are so archaic that it's embarrassing. And I kind of I recognized that once the problem came to the border, it was too late. And we have literally, President Biden's been in Washington for 50 years, been on the foreign relations and chaired it for many, many years, was our vice president for eight, been president for three. This is a failure of generations and administrations over his entire career in Washington, including as his, during his own presidency. And there are ways to improve security, by the way, not just in the southern border, but in the northern, on our northern border. I live in Minnesota. I'm not saying there's an influx of people coming across, but it happens. Mm -hmm. Come right across farms in Manitoba, right into Minnesota. Who are they? Where do they go? We never know. And I say this because we are facing an international crisis in the Middle East, war in Eastern Europe, adversaries all around the world that know they can send people, not through JFK, they can send people any way they want through our north or uh, south border. We need security. It's for national security. But let me make the proposition a thoughtful, humane, welcoming immigration policy. But then the most important part is our asylum program. Our law that has been in place for ages forces migrants to come across the border. Only then can they declare asylum. What does that mean? That means when I think about this, I, I, I see it right now, the young woman I saw crossing the river with her baby. I thought she probably worked for 10 years, eight years, who knows, to save up every penny she could, because it costs six to $7,000 per person mm -hmm. to pay the Mexican gangs and cartels to bring them across the border. She probably worked many, many years, saved every dollar, gave them every dollar, and they drop her at the darn river for her to walk across into the arms of border patrol agents. And I thought to myself, why do we not use our foreign aid dollars to build dormitories next to our consulates in the Northern Triangle countries? Why don't we use our foreign aid dollars to invest in some security and safety and some opportunity, economic opportunity? Why do we not have an asylum system where you declare it, file asylum in the country of origin, have specialists on the ground there to adjudicate the case because they know better than once you get up here? And then best of all, if you qualify for asylum, we'll bring you to the United States. And then you'll have your six or $7,000 in your pocket to start a new life. But what do we make them do right now? They spend all their money. They come here with nothing. They cross the border. They're processed. They go off into who knows where, sleeping on streets and shelters. Uh, and then we ask them to show up for a court case maybe a year, two, three down the road. And if anyone thinks that's smart policy, mm -hmm. you're living in the twilight zone. And it can be fixed. There's a thoughtful bill right now called the Dign Dignity Act that is um, Rep. Salazar from Florida, Republican, uh, and Rep. Escobar from Texas, both of them my friends, who have a thoughtful solution to this. But in politics in Washington, nobody wants to touch it because they might actually lose their next election because base voters are going to get upset with them. And that's why I'm tired of the nonsense. Mm -hmm. So that's how we fix it. We do what I just said. We adjudicate cases there. Uh, we change the dynamic before it gets to our border. Uh, and we secure it in the spirit of both national security and a humane immigration policy the same one that has benefited just about 99% of you in this room today, including my own family. That's how we do it. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Okay. We're opening it up. We definitely have time for some questions. Yeah. Please. And by the way, I'm going to stay. If someone's question doesn't get answered because we run out of time, I'm not leaving Hanover until I answer them all. I promise you. <laughs> um, and just hi. say your name and where you're from, too. Hi, I'm B. I'm from Rochester, New York. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I know that you said that we need, you said, and I quote, we need a two-state solution. We need the United States to continue to support Israel, and we need to eradicate Hamas. Um, there's a lot of division in the Democratic Party about the Israel-Hamas conflict right now. Um, I'd love to hear um, your first act in office regarding the conflict, what you would do. Thank you. Well, uh, I'll make this real easy. I intend to be the first Jewish president in American history, and I intend to be the president that finally signs documents that help create a Palestinian state. Plain and simple. Uh, it's long overdue. Yeah. Uh, but let me, start, let me back up a little bit and just start with my values, which is 
I believe in human beings. And, and nothing has broken my heart more than seeing the conflict in the Middle East, but more probably than right now is to seeing the conflict here in the United States, much of it on college campuses. Uh, I was at Lou's Diner today, and I have to tell you, for the first time, I really um, had some interactions that hurt me, really hurt me. Uh, when I hear people say, I support Hamas, that's troublesome to me, because Hamas does not support the Palestinian people, and it certainly doesn't support the Israeli people. When I hear people say that Israel does not have the right to exist, or won't acknowledge it, that hurts me. And it's really hard for someone who believes so deeply in conversation to find common ground. If you cannot acknowledge those two things, Hamas is destructive, does, most Palestinians do not want them representing them, they've been subject to them, and if you say that Israel doesn't have a right to exist, it's hard to have a conversation. I want to start with those values. Because I believe that there is, not only does Israel have a right to exist, I think there's a need for it. And when half of American high school students are not familiar with the Holocaust, mm. is it surprising that we're in a circumstance now where they do not understand why there must be one nation in the world with a Jewish majority that, can take re that Jews can take refuge in? When, not if, when the next pogrom or Holocaust occurs, when anti-Semitism, which is any of you in the room who are Jewish know how it feels right now. Now, I know I don't look like someone whose community needs support or affection or protection, but let me tell you, we do. I'm not ashamed to say that. So I care about Israel. I care about Israelis. I believe it needs a, we need a place for refuge. The United States of America did not accept Jewish refugees as the Holocaust started. We turned them away in a boat, and they went back, and they were sent to concentration camps, and they were killed. That's why there needs to be an Israel. Not to mention historically, that's another conversation. So with that, what Hamas did on October 7th was one of the most despicable, disgusting, horrific things I've ever seen. And if you have not seen the video, uh, let me assure you there's even worse video that members of Congress have been able to, um, to view. I've never seen another human being rip a fetus from a woman's uterus and then celebrate. I've never seen people celebrate when they literally decapitate children in front of parents. I've never seen people celebrate when they um, butcher parents in front of their children, making them watch. There is nothing more inhumane than what I've seen by these people. And with all that said, they have to be eliminated because they are sworn to the destruction of a sovereign state. They are sworn to the destruction of an entire people. They have not allowed an election since 2006, and there was a survey just the day before that was completed in Gaza that very, was very clearly indicating that most Palestinians do not want Hamas representing them, because they don't represent them. Hamas represents Iran. And the reason that they did that on October 7th is we were this close, having been to Jerusalem twice, and Riyadh, and to Turkey, to actually try to push and triangulate this thing to get done. We were this close, I think to the Israelis normalizing with the Saudis, something I never imagined would be possible. And the reason they did that then is that they knew it was close, and they knew they did not want peace, and they knew they did not want prosperity, and they knew they actually didn't want Palestinian self-determination because that would eliminate Hamas as their leaders. And that's, I think, why they did it. So they have to be eliminated, and then I'll make my case more broadly. We need new leadership in the United States. Israel needs new leadership. I've looked Benjamin Netanyahu in the eye, and I do not like what I saw. I do not like his government. I do not like his settlement policy. It is actually affecting a community here in the United States, not to mention Israelis and Palestinians. He's got to go. Israelis have to make that choice. Americans have to make a choice. And Palestinians have to make a choice. And should they choose in both the West Bank and Gaza? By the way, the PA is just as corrupt as any government in the world. They still have a pay for slave program where if you kill an Israeli, you get rewarded for it. It's the truth. And if Palestinians choose peace in Gaza and the West Bank, and if Israelis choose peace with a new government, I cannot wait to make that my core mission because I believe that is existential to the entire world. And the only way we're gonna reunite as a country here in the United States, the only way Israelis and Palestinians can live side by side in peace and security and prosperity, the only way I think the rest of the, the world can end this nonsense of war and get back to peace is if we solve that problem. And it's gonna take a big village Americans, Israelis, Palestinians, the Chinese, the Gulf states, and the Arab world to do it. And we can. And I'm sick of people telling me for 50 years they can't. That's how I feel. I believe in humanity. I would love my Israeli friends and brothers and sisters. And I love my Palestinian 
friends and brothers and sisters. Um, Rashida Tlaib is a friend of mine. It's hard sometimes, but I know in her heart, her life experience dictates how she's acting and how she's feeling. And she knows how my life experience is affecting how I'm feeling. And if she and I can maintain our relationship, even if it's really tough sometimes, I know anything is possible. And that's why we have to do this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have two in the middle over here. There you go. And you see your, yeah, your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Thomas. Hey, Thomas. Um, I'm actually from Excelsior. So I'm oh, I got to give. I represent <laughs> Thomas. Hey, nice to meet you. Min Minnetonka High School? Yes. Hey, I love it. A skipper. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> my question for you is um, what would it take for you to uh, lose hope with bipartisanship with our Republican politicians? Sorry, ah. that's kind of a hard one. <laughs> um, yeah. I was, you know, look at I was blessed, I think, with optimism. You know, and I and I know that's a I know that's something that you just either you got, and if you got it, you gotta use it, and I do. I have had dark days in Congress, let me assure you. Um, and I'm, I'll tell you one story about that and let you know why I've not lo lost optimism. On January 6th, I was trapped in the House chamber. Um, everybody on the floor kind of was able to get off and in, in into the tunnels and into safety. About 20 of us Democrats were trapped in the the, the gallery, the mezzanine level. And when the doors were slammed and glass started breaking and the sirens and all the noise and the horror, uh, they, the police screamed at us to uh, put on our masks and hide behind chairs and look for something to defend yourselves. And we literally had, I mean, all we had was pencils and pens. I mean, that's literally all we had. And it was really, those 15 minutes for everybody, by the way, Democrats and Republicans, those 15 minutes were the most horrifying of most of our lives. And I say that with respect to people who've gone through trauma because I have a whole lot more respect for what that feels like and how it manifests itself in the days, weeks, and months, and even years thereafter. Uh, but to sit there and think that those are your last 15 minutes and if, do you say goodbye to your family? Do you let them know how scared you really are? Because we assume they had guns. We assume they're coming to kill us, Democrats. And what happened was something pretty remarkable. We escaped. Tell you a little funny story. We finally, we, in groups of 10, we were finally let out uh, through a hallway. I saw on my right all the insurrectionists on the floor, all of our US Capitol Police and Metropolitan Police, because of course Donald Trump did not send the National Guard, which he could have. Uh, they had their long guns out with all these people laying on the floors with their hands out. They told us to get in the elevator and push sub basement to get to the tunnels, and then take the tunnels. We'll be escorted running to a safe room. We get in the elevator, and a new Republican member of Congress, a friend, pushes not the sub-basement button, but one. <laughs> and let me tell you, there was this silence in that elevator <laughs> that was so deafening. And we held our breath and we took, I mean, and, and thankfully, there was nobody there when the door opened. We got in the tunnel, we run out. We're brought to a safe room, uh, the Ways and Means Committee Room, which is where they held us. And it was a really interesting moment because here were probably 100 Democrats and Republicans in the main room, uh, and then probably 20 of us in this little ante room, they call it, with a TV on. And I'm standing there with Liz Cheney, probably four Republicans, a bunch of Democrats, watching, waiting for the president to at least say something to end this nonsense. Finally, you know, a couple hours in, he does. And I never forgot, because Liz Cheney, who at that time was the third ranking member of the Republican conference and the single most conservative member of the entire Republican Party in the House. And frankly, I wasn't that close to her then. And she's looking at the TV, Donald Trump comes on to make his horrible statement that did nothing, and she points to the television, and she says, he's responsible, and we're gonna hold him to account. And there was silence for a moment, and then everybody, Democrats and Republicans, together, started, yeah. And there was a feeling in that room that, for the first time in my service in Congress, the first time since I joined, and frankly, the last time since that moment, that I literally didn't feel like a Democrat. They didn't feel like Republicans. We literally just felt like Americans, the way that it is supposed to be. And it was an awesome feeling. And we went back that night, 
I buy another quick story. I go into the rotunda at about 12.30 in the morning, a beautiful place to be when it's dark and it's empty. Walked there with my buddy Tom Malinowski and, and the place was destroyed. I mean, there was garbage and there were hand ties and there were clubs and there were sticks and all the crap that the insurrectionists just left behind, even including feces and just, it was nauseating. And, and we see, a, we see a, someone in the corner with a bag picking up garbage. And we walked over, we assumed it was um, you know, one of the custodian staff in the Capitol or something. We walk over and it's Andy Kim, Democrat from New Jersey who's now running for Senate against one of the most corrupt senators in the United States Senate, Mr. Menendez. And he's on his hands and knees, very emotional picking up that room because he says to Don, Tom and me, he's like, you know what, my parents came to this country I'm a first generation American and I'm not gonna leave until this place is cleaned up. And he was alone, he wasn't doing it for the cameras. You know, if you wanna know what kind of man this guy is, that's all you need to know. So we do that, we go back and finish our job and here I'll get make this long story short. We, we finally certify the election against all odds. And over the course of the next year, Liz Cheney pursuing principle um, ensures that there is a proceeding against the president because he inspired the insurrection. As you know, she was on the committee, and she voted along with nine other Republicans to impeach the president for doing something that I think is one of the worst and most damaging um, things a president has ever done. And what happened to her? She was dismissed from, first of all, her leadership. She started hanging out on our side of the aisle, which is how I got to know her. She voted to impeach along with nine others, and nine of those 10 that had the audacity to support the United States Constitution and uphold their own principles, nine of the 10 were essentially summarily dismissed from the United States House in primaries, by resignations, because of threats against them, Liz Cheney amongst them. And if you told me in 2016, the night of that election when Donald Trump was elected, if you told me the day of January 6th before the insurrection that I would do an ad for Liz Cheney, which I did, I'd say you're out of your minds. And it's a moment like that because of people like her, Anthony Gonzalez, uh, Fred Upton, Peter Meyer, that had the courage and the conviction and the principle to torpedo their own careers so that the United States of America wasn't torpedoed, I think those are some of the most important, extraordinary Americans that have ever lived in our era. And that's why I will never give up, ever give up, on bipartisanship. Because you do not know the mettle of somebody until they're faced with a crisis like that. And it's not easy and I'm sometimes disgusted, and I'm sometimes dismayed, but if anyone in this room or in this country thinks that one party or the other can beat us into prosperity and safety and security and justice, you're out of your minds. Mm -hmm. And that's why none other than George Washington warned our country in his farewell address as he left the presidency that three things would destroy this great experiment in democracy. Factions, I think he called it regionalism, which is small states, big states, rural, urban kind of divides, and foreign influence and interference. And my goodness, if those three things haven't kind of come together and intersected at the same time, I don't know what is, but that's why we gotta be careful and that's why I believe so deeply in working with others and that's why when I'm president, I will have conservative voices in the White House to ensure that I'm not surrounded by the very yes people that have surrounded presidents for the last probably 30 years. And that's who I am and that's why I believe in it. Thank you. We have, I think we might be up to the last one. We'll see. Oh, how, darn it. We'll I'm, see, see, I'm talking too much. I'm get. sorry. I'm not going to, but no, I'm serious. I'm going to hang around here until everybody gets their <laughs> questions. People question will done. take you up yeah. on it, I bet. Hi, I'm hey. Rachel. I'm from Seattle, Washington. Hey, Rachel. Um, you're often described as a moderate Democrat. Beyond your belief in bipartisanship, what are some of your ideological and policy beliefs that separate you from the more leftist Democrats and from Republicans? Mm -hmm. I gotta tell you, it's really funny because I'm a progressive. Mm. And because I'm pragmatic, I'm labeled as a centrist or a moderate. You know, it's very funny because um, <laughs> Republicans like to say, oh, he's not, he's not a moderate because he voted 100% of the time with President Biden, right? And then it's kind of, on the opposite side, it's kind of, it's the reverse. You see that, you're, so in politics, you're usually, when people are attacking you for the same reason from both sides, you probably are onto something. And what I tell my progressive friends is like, look, if you want to embed social workers uh, and increase emotional and mental health provision within police departments, 
it's probably not a good line to use defund the police. What might be a better way to say it is let's fund social workers and uh, mental and emotional health provision. When I, think about, when I think about Medicare for all, when I think about how it's been presented, the fact is most Republicans in this country, voters, they want a national health insurance system because they are so horrified and disgusted by the health insurers who deny their claims and then earn $20 billion a year, including one in my district, United Health, earns $20 billion a year in net income. By the way, they do some good things and good people, but they deny claims and then they earn $20 billion a year and people then have the audacity to say, well, uh, we don't have enough money in the system and we could never have a system that makes sure everybody's covered. That's not true at all. It's disgusting. It's really, really disgusting. And do any of you feel that, that way, by the way? Mm -hmm. so, so what I say is I have these common ground dinners. I actually talk to Republicans. I listen to how they talk about it. I understand why Democrats get it all wrong in our packaging and our articulation and the words we use and the phrases. And I say, what if we looked at it like this? What if we presented and packaged it like that? What about the gentleman I sat at a table with, um, with the, um, the DP, DPA, is it DPA? DPU. DPU, sorry, DPU. Mm -hmm. What about the guy today who's a conservative who says to me, the one, I'm pro-life, and I think one of the ways to actually reduce the incidence of abortion is to raise the foundation for Americans, to make sure we have pre-K education, to make sure we have uh, child care, to make sure that we have um, uh, food on every kid's table. And I think to myself, oh my goodness, this was my epiphany. <clears throat> That's what makes me a moderate, <laughs> is that I have decent common sense principles <clears throat> that I simply want to get done. And as long as we have two parties that use terminologies and divisions and Fox News and MSNBC to fight each other, uh, we're never gonna get it done. So my voting record is pretty progressive, but I am pro, I'm, I'm pro worker and I'm pro business. They're not mutually exclusive, they're mutually mandatory. I'm fiscally responsible and I'm socially inclusive and probably even liberal. That's what most Americans are. This notion that if you're a Democrat, you cannot talk about how absolutely out of control our fiscal management is, that we have a $33 trillion debt, $2 trillion annual deficit, and probably gonna be approaching $800 billion a year in debt service. Why as a Democrat can I not say that we need border security and we need law enforcement, and the, the communities begging the most for more safety and more police officers are actually my black communities who are furious who are furious that somehow this whole thing has been hijacked into some nonsensical debate about whether or not we should be funding police. So I say to you just that these labels are just nonsensical. I'm common sense, I'm reasonable, I wanna get things done, I wanna solve problems. And if I'm branded a centrist or a moderate, probably because I'm a white man, I can't do anything about it. But let me assure you, um, that's the big problem in our country right now, I would say. And I would just ask that all of you dig a little deeper, look into the people whose names are not well known, because they're actually the ones that are gonna make the biggest difference in the country. And as long as the others are gonna label them to defeat them and demean them, disenfranchise them, and then divide us, then we got big problems. So I'll leave, I'll leave it at this though. In this, I think I mentioned this, uh, uh, this survey, this poll that came out where President Trump is defeating Joe Biden 48 to 44 in all the battleground states. And when they ask the question about if it's not Joe Biden, let's say it's a generic Democrat, who would you vote for? 48 to 40, the same people say we'll vote for the generic Democrat. 48 to 40, a 12 point swing. So I've never aspired to be generic. <laughs> never aspired to be a centrist or a moderate. I'm a Humphrey Democrat. I believe the moral test of government is how we treat those in the dawn of life, the dus dusk of life, and in the shadows of life. And I'll be your generic Democrat if that means I can defeat Donald Trump much more ably than President Biden can. I'll take any label, I'll cross any river, I'll take any arrow, any punch, any attack, because the pain that Americans are feeling right now is so much worse than any of the labels or attacks on me. And I just thank you for your question and let you know that uh, labels are a real problem in this country right now. So I got time. 
I know, I, unless they shut out the lights and say you got to get out. If anybody has any more questions right now, please ask me. If you got to go, I totally respect that too. Yeah, feel free. Come anybody right got on questions? Over. Oh, do you want to well, come any students? stay around? Yeah, so yeah. We'll cut anyone... off this part of the program and then focus. Hey, well, most of all, can I tell a story quick before you all go? Seriously, if if you have one more minute, I want to tell you a story. It's really important. You'll appreciate it because I told you I'd wrap this up. It's about you. All right, my friends. I just shared that with a small group. 30 seconds. 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Okay. At my home, I do, a, I do a series called Common Ground. I get six Democrats and six Republicans together at a table. We break bread. We introduce ourselves. We tell a little bit of our life story. We debate policy. I think I just told you about this. A group called Braver Angels, one of my dear friends who's a Republican, just saw me at Gettysburg at the National Convention not long ago. They provide a facilitator who actually facilitates this amazing conversation between Democrats and Republicans. At the end of this, we talk about health care and, and, um, and immigration, some of the things we talked about tonight. At the end of it, we go around the table and everybody gets to share a little bit about what they got out of this experience. And we had a circumstance about six months ago where a young woman, Emily, looks at a guy across the table, Dave, and says, Dave, when you drove up in your F-150 with the Trump sticker, I almost got back in my car, left the parking lot, and could barely go in the building, let alone sit at the table with you. <laughs> And she said, but Dave, I got to say, I, I, I can't believe it, but I really like you. And, you. and I learned a few things, and I just, I'm so glad I came in. And we go around the table, and it gets to Dave, and he looks at Emily and says, Emily, when you drove up in your Prius, I wanted to run it over. But he said, I am so glad I didn't because you're a really cool woman. And I never even sat down with a liberal before. And you're cool, and I learned something from you, and I'm just so psyched that I came today. And at that moment... Emily and Dave stood up and in front of all of us embraced. And to see a bleeding heart liberal who barely could make it into the building and a dyed in the wool bombastic Trumper hug it out in front of all of us gave me the moment that I've been seeking probably my whole life and certainly my whole career in politics, which is only five and a half years. Because if that is my only legacy, my only legacy not just in this pursuit, but in my life, it would have all been worthwhile. So as I start this in front of you, I ask you to think about them because I know we can do it. I know how to do it. I know it's possible. I know it's what we need in the White House. And think about Emily and Dave as you meet people every day who see things differently and think differently and pray differently and look differently and come from different places. It is entirely possible. And I think it is the job of the American president in the 21st century to focus on that more than anything else and repair. And that's why I want to thank all of you tonight. Have a good night. Awesome. Thank you. And if, if anybody wants thank you, Congressman. anybody wants photos, selfies, questions, if you want to join my campaign, come on down. <laughs>